Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and this is the podcast where we talk about things that matter. We're going to be talking about something today that's of interest to many and should be interest to all, Christian nationalism. Our guest is William Wolfe. He's a husband and a father of three. He's got an MDiv from the same institution I do. Uh, he is studying there at Southern Seminary for a PhD in ethics and public theology. He is a 10-year veteran of the conservative political movement. He worked as a senior official in the Trump administration, both as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon and Director of Legislative Affairs at the Department of State. He's worked for three different representatives as well as a staffer. He's got lots of experience, been in politics. He's a faithful brother in Christ. And we're going to be talking about these things. I hope it's helpful and that you glean much from it. Enjoy. Welcome to the show, William. How are you doing today, man? Good. Thank you for having me on, Richard. Glad to be here. Yeah, brother. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming. And I know some people confuse you with Stephen Wolf, the author of uh, The Case for Christian Nationalism. Uh, are you guys related at all other than in Adam or in Noah or, or no? It, I, I guess in Christ, actually. Okay. That. Well, that's too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. We could be. Um, yeah, everybody you know, We back, could right. be. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I know some people. I was it James Lindsay did a thing with you know the two wolves, the lesser and the greater, and this and that. So anyway, yeah, we, won't, we won't get too much into that, but we will be talking about Christian nationalism uh, and kind of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just you know jump right in? What do you uh, or how do you define Christian nationalism? Because it's I think you can get ten people and eleven different definitions, right? Uh, and sure. So, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of hubbub right now with G3 and those guys and the MacArthur type, type guys versus mm -hmm. Cannon Press and Doug Wilson guys and guys like you and, you know, a couple, a couple other guys in our circle and stuff and pushing back. And I feel like we're talking past each other and it really, mm -hmm. and, and people are like, you want to force people to be Christian, this and that. So anyway, what, how do you define Christian nationalism? Yeah, man. Christian nation gooder than trans and kids. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's a funny meme that's been circulating um, with the idea that this is such a simple complex that this, like, on either ends of that spectrum, both the simpleton and the, you know, genius Chad get it, and the, the mitwit in the middle is trying to make it really complicated, you know, but you could just say Christian nation, you know, more gooder than trans and kids. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one sort of humorous way to put it. But Richard, as I, as I join us today, I wanted to do something that I think is a little bit unique to the way that I've engaged Christian nationalism, different from many of the other brothers who have, before I get to my specific definition, if you'll just give me a couple minutes to give uh, a little bit of the history of how we got here in the evangelical world to having this sort of breakout conversation on Christian nationalism. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Because what's happening right now is we're seeing intra-reformed, intra-faithful, intra-woke, you know, non -woke, um, back and forth on Christian nationalism. And what's happened is we've sort of detached ourselves from the, the setting, which was this. In 2016, Donald Trump won the presidential election. It shocked the world. And that shock sent uh, secular academics, particularly those who study religion and society, reeling. That statistic of, you know, 80 whatever percent it was white evangelicals who voted for Trump, despite, you know, Trump's personal moral issues, uh, you know, sort of was a huge question that demanded an answer. And you have to realize, Richard, that these secular, godless Marxist academics wanted to propose an answer that painted Christians in the worst light possible. Now, Christian nationalism was already working its way into the literature and in, in, from these sociologists, gender historians, you know, critics of faith and religion, etc. But it really took off after 2016. And the most foundational book that really launched it i mean i hate to give these guys credit because i think quite frankly they're just both they're both such bad actors seeking to demonize christians but the book is taking america back for god by samuel perry and andrew whitehead and that that book was about you know christian nationalism and in that in that book richard they have a survey with six questions and i'll just list a couple of them one of them is the federal government should advocate for christian values Another one is the federal government should allow the display of religious symbols in public places or the success of the United States as part of God's plan 
the federal government should allow prayer in public schools. When you take this survey, Richard, and if you haven't, you should take it. You, you rank yourself one to four on each of these questions. Almost every Bible-believing Christian is going to come out as either sort of a, a, an accommodator or ambassador of Christian nationalism. And so what happened to me was I was in this class and I read this book and I realized, oh, I see what these guys are doing. And this is what Christians need to be smart about. You need to see what these people are doing. They're trying to take Christian nationalism and make it a pejorative for faithful Bible-believing Christians who believe in things like man-woman marriage, the sanctity of life, the you know biblical you know gender roles in the home and even in the culture more broadly, um, that that America should honor God rightly, whatever that looks like. And all of a sudden, we're dangerous Christian nationalists. And so I saw the rhetorical play, and I actually thought, well, you know what? This is a great term because I'm not a globalist; I'm a nationalist. Mm -hmm. So what type of nationalist should I be? Well, I don't want to be a white nationalist. I denounce that wholeheartedly. I'm not going to be a, a black nationalist. I'm not going to be an Islamic nationalist. I'm not going to be a rainbow flag nationalist. I want to be a Christian nationalist mm. because I believe these things. and I believe that nations have a responsibility to honor God. So I just want to give that little bit of a background. So we have Taking America Back for God from Perry and Whitehead. We've got uh, you know Jesus and John Wayne from Kristen Dumay, The Power Worshippers by Catherine Stewart. We have this guy... Um, Andrew Seidel, who is really a revisionist historian who specializes in trying to sort of chop up and demonize the American Christian founding. He has the founding myth why Christian nationalism is, is un-American. And so as I explored these books for an academic paper, I was pressed with this question. What do I think about Christian nationalism? Is it good or bad? And quite frankly, because of even how the opponents of it defined it, I realized I was a Christian nationalist. I'll mm. pause there for a second and let you engage some of that if you have any thoughts or if you've heard that history before. I hope your listeners learn yeah. something there. Yeah, I mean, I've heard of Dumez. I've not read the book. I've got a friend who does, he's got a podcast too, and he did a review of that book and it was atrocious. Um, and just some other, I've not heard of a ton of that, to be totally honest. I don't know how much the audience has, but uh, yeah, it's it's no doubt people want to, I mean, we see this more and more and I think this isn't new where we saw this with you know January 6th and this oh i i'm for this but in reality they're spies right they're 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 double agents or not double agents but they're a spy from you know leftism to infiltrate whatever and i mean we were talking off air and you were talking about a fed and this and that and you know writing some stuff against you and you know we see this other guy i forget his name uh who was instigating stuff on on the 6th there of january and and everybody's protecting this guy but everybody else gets and it's just like wait what and you 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 can't now trust even the most basic uh things with with oh this guy's for this oh they've got an american flag i mean we saw this with the tiki torches a few years ago and charlottesville and uh, i mean we could go on and on so anyway you can continue i mean that's that's i'm not surprised i'll just say that <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, look, actually, actually, Richard, there's no, I, I am under no, um, uh, no illusions of the fact that I think that there are high placed uh, bad actors who are a part of generating sort of this, this movement of trying to label faithful Bible believing Christians as Christian nationalists. And you've seen them rhetorically move on from Christian nationalists to white Christian nationalists, the flag and the cross by Perry and Gorski, you know, the threat of white Christian nationalism. And if you watch the way that this stuff is presented in the news, it all almost always comes with that um, adjectival description, the threat, uh, you know, at, at the outset of it. And again, the threat here to be very clear, Richard, the threat is that we would do things like overturn Roe v. Wade. The mm -hmm. threat is that we would do things like uphold man, woman, marriage. The threat is that we would do things like ask for Christian values and moralities to be normative in society, again, for the flourishing of all peoples. <laughs> Those are the threats, because, again, yeah. the people we're dealing with here are radical deconstructionists who want to uproot America. They're, they're, they're channeling the energies of the cultural Marxists and the Frankfurt School, no doubt about it. So so those were the those are sort of what we had to deal with in terms of uh, a body of literature that's being produced that that's engaging Christian nationalism criti critically. So then what does William Wolfe think about Christian nationalism? I'll jump into this. I, I'd love for people to hear this. So Christian nationalism, two pieces to that equation, right? The Christian and the nationalism. Let's just do the nationalism here real, real quick first, because I want pastors, and here's a problem, Richard, there's a lot of pastors out there 
who are wonderful theologians, wonderful brothers, but they're not political philosophers. They don't have political experience. They're not really political thinkers. And so they approach political philosophy, political science. They approach these things through an exclusive the theological lens. And I'm not saying as Christians, we don't bring a theological lens to what we do. Of course we do. But these are separate disciplines. And so we need to think again, like Christian nationalism is not a doctrine, <laughs> right? Christian nationalism is a political ideology. So we need to engage it as such. So here is my definition. Here's the definition of nationalism I think is really good. This is a very academic definition. It comes from John Bruley. He's the editor of the Oxford Handbook of the History of Nationalism. And this is what he says. He says, here's some good context. He says, of all modern political ideologies, nationalism appears to be the most through and through historical. So what he means by that is nationalism is a historical way of how people have ordered themselves. Now, na nations have risen and fallen. Empires have subsumed smaller nations. But as you trace, you know, you trace all through history, essentially you get to a breaking point, what's known as the Peace of Westphalia, when, you know, sort of we, we, dis, we established this principle of sovereign nation states, you know, as much as you would understand it back then. And particularly with the out, coming out of the Reformation and the end of the, uh, the end of the, you know, Holy Roman Empire dominating Europe, then you also get this idea of whose realm, whose religion, or which realm, whose religion. So you break up into separate sort of ethnic national groupings that then have the freedom to practice different religions than just the mandated, you know, Catholic religion that everybody was subject to. But so then, so that's what he means by it's historical. It's risen and fallen, but it sort of has really broken out the last couple hundred years. But here's the definition. He says that nationalism is the claim that there exists a unique nation, that this nation has a special value and therefore right to existence and recognition, and that to secure this right, the nation must possess autonomy, often understood as a sovereign nation state. Now, I don't know what you think about that. I think that's a wonderful definition. I think that there are unique nations. They have the right to exist. They have the right to control their borders and to sovereignly control their lands and care for their people. That yeah. doesn't seem controversial to me. What do you think? No, I mean, I, I, it's it's not at all. Um, but I think the trouble with so many things is we've been swimming. I mean, our whole lives, obviously, we're younger than 60, you know, a lot of people, right? There's still a lot of boomers around and everything else. Um, but even, even most boomers, you know, not to be disparaging, but I would say since probably the forties into the fifties, we've been swimming in this whole different paradigm, you know, sexual revolution, no fault divorce, Roe v. Wade, on and on and on. And it's like, where we've been taught to hate ourselves, right? We've been taught. And I think this is where a lot of, I mean, you're in Louisville and I used to live there. I saw more gay trans leftist knee-jerk reaction type people than i ever did in la now i wasn't in west hollywood which is like on fire flaming gay right but still i'm saying like nor there's a lot of normal people although this was 10 years ago there's a lot of normal people in california a lot of just regular people a lot of hard-working you know immigrants and others whether they're legal or illegal regardless you know just set that aside for a moment there's a lot of people that are not ragingly liberal ragingly homosexual ragingly all this stuff. but in louisville it was. And I feel like there's this reaction against it because it's the Midwest or the South or who have you asked. And people kind of push back against these things because we've been we've been not, I don't know, catechized in such a bad way with kind of just this default leftism, second wave feminism and all these other things that then people push against the norms of church or, oh, I'm not a Baptist or whatever. And their parents then don't have an answer because they've just, the parents have been swimming in it for their whole life. And then they think, well, nationalism, that's not, that's not good. We should, we're all equal. We're all the same. And, and, and therefore we shouldn't be special. America is not any different than, you know, uh, Nigeria or Ethiopia or, or China. Yeah, we're all the same. And, and yet if you look at these other nations, I mean, take for China, right? They, don't allow the TikTok that they produce that we, we get. They don't allow it for their own people, right? They have right. height restrictions. They they're against homosexuality. They don't even let I think people trans until they're twenty one, and even that they encourage the family to shame them. And so say what you will about the CCP, which there's a lot to say, lots of bad stuff to say. There's still this level of they know what's right and good in at least certain areas. Of course, I'm not apologist for the CCP at all, but at the same time, 
they then will, you know, I think it's a cold war, really. They're pushing and trying to, you know, dismantle, which I think it's working, uh, just our own family, getting in the heads of our teens, getting in the heads of wives and husbands. Uh, as a whole of the show, really. But <laughs> it, it's, I think we've just been swimming in it. We can't tell. And as soon as something goes against that current, we're like, wait a second, we're not special. Sorry, we're not special. We're 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 just regular people. We're you know we're just the same as anybody else. And it's like, but are we though? And does Poland or Finland or you know anybody else, the UK, do they not get the right to distinguish themselves from other people? Because there are good countries, and I think that's the the trick. The trick is there are good places, good countries. There's good religion, and you know, as the old band, bad religion. Um, Jesus is better. And I think even a lot of Christians, we don't see that. And we don't really, we just kind of think it's a smorgasbord of different options. And we jump up mm -hmm. to the table, like, well, you know, you know, Islam is all about the same and in this and, you know, Hinduism, mm -hmm. I'm not really sure, you know, if you want Jesus, cool, if not. And it's like, no, God's ways are better. They're higher than our ways. And we so often forget that. So that was a Sure. Well, essentially, no, what, what a couple, a couple key things you brought out there, which is essentially is it's what's known as the post-war consensus which has uh, really eroded our ability to interact with the concept of nationalism rightly and nationalism as a political ideology, which makes some very humble and basic claims when understood correctly, which is not so much that one nation is more special than another nation, but that nations are unique and that nations should have the ability to be sovereign over their territory and over their people. But the post-war consensus, which was something that was popularized by philosopher Karl Popper in his book, The Open Society and Its Enemies. His thesis was essentially that strong, strong loves, love of truth, like commitment to objective truth, uh, commitment to religion, commitment to family, to nation, these strong ties and strong loves, these closed sort of loves. It's like, you know, I love my family more than I love another family. That sort of closes a circuit, right? I love my nation more than I love other nations. That closes right. a circuit. His argument was that these strong loves are those out of which horrors like World War II come and, and national wars and global wars. And so his argument was we needed to, we needed to have open societies that right embrace sort of, a, a, you know, universal truth. And that's good, kind of what you were touching on there. And the open society concept, you might be familiar with this term from, you know, some someone like George Soros, which this is not an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. This is just a fact. George Soros actually later penned an, uh, an introduction in a previous edition of Open Society and Its Enemies by Karl yeah. Popper. George Soros is the living translator of Karl Popper's ideology. And this is where we get globalism. This is where we get organizations like the World Economic Forum, which are seeking to, uh, or like the World Health Organization. This is all part of Popper's project. And Popper's project had great sway in, in America for many decades. You could listen to a speech by, um, by uh, George H.W. Bush um, at the United Nations, where he talks about free people, free societies, open borders, et cetera. Anyway, so that's the nationalism part, Richard. And it's really important to realize that uh, Christians are not exempt from the political pressures of the day and age that we live in. We, yeah. live, we are bounded by space and time, and we live in a particular context. And right now here in the, you know, the first couple of decades of the 21st century, Christians in countries all around the world, not unique to America. I mean, you can look at England and what happened with Brexit. Um, Christians need to ask ourselves, do we believe in sovereign nation states? And is that actually a good that be, can be defended from scripture, which I think that it is. Uh, I think globalism was tried and found one thing at the Tower of Babel. And ever since then, we've seen nations that have been God sort of intervening grace in the life of civil society. Mm -hmm. Stephen Wolf makes a case that nations would have developed in a pre-fall world. Some people don't believe that. Some people believe fundamentally that nations are post-fall, post-Babel. But I think that's, I personally don't think that that's too relevant to the question facing us today, which is, are we going to be a nation or are we going to be part of a globalist communist state? Right. And my answer to that is let's be a nation. So I'm a nationalist in that sense. So then what type of nationalist should I be? Let me, let's, let me touch on the Christian part. So what do I mean by the Christian part of the equation of Christian nationalism? And this is where some of our good brothers are getting confused. Christian is an adjective that can be used to describe things other than the gospel and saving faith. 
We do this all the time. We talk about Christian families. We talk about Christian schools. We talk about Christian colleges. I mean, Zambia is a country that has a Christian preamble to their constitution. I'm okay with calling Zambia a Christian country, even if not every soul in Zambia is converted, nor do I expect them to be. So when I use Christian and Christian nationalism, I do not mean sort of the one true spiritual religion, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. What I mean is Christian is the defining content of the nationalism at hand. It's not a racial nationalism. It's not an ethnic nationalism. But I would argue that Christian nationalism takes as its central feature, particularly in America, the heritage of our Christian founding and the assumed Christian moral order and Christian ethics as the foundation for ordering our nation's moral imagination and civil life over and against particularly postmodern liberalism and atheistic secularism, right? So there's gonna be a competing orthodoxy in the public square and too many Christians have bought into the myth of neutrality, which doesn't exist. There will be an orthodoxy, not in a, not in a religious sense, not in a confess this sense or we're gonna put you to death, but there's going to be a public orthodoxy, an ideological orthodoxy. And right now, you and I both know that the ideological orthodoxy that has supplanted Christianity in the United States is sort of, you know, radical you know, cultural Marxism, wokeism, whatever you want to call it. That, you know, has one one brother I saw in this, this clip from Australia, the gay sex religion, <laughs> you know, that's become our cultural yeah. orthodoxy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, and this is a really interesting point too, and I'll make this and kind of tie this point off, which is that, you know, uh, there was a political philosopher in the post-war era, John Rawls, and he argued that, you know, we would kind of continuing Popper's project in certain ways that, you know, we need to, we need to make all of our sort of like overarching objective decisions off of like principles of utilitarianism and sort of um, physical harm. Like the only thing the government can do is sort of is sort of intervene in physical harm between individuals, contracts, violence, but the government in no way, shape or form should be sort of policing the morality of their individuals. This is sort of, this is Rawlsianism. And the John Rawls in the post-war era and post-war consensus era, they thought that they create this sort of neutral public square and neutral public, you know, public arena in which all of the people who had competing claims could work it out. But the problem is that was just a halfway house to another totalitizing orthodoxy. And so we're gonna have uh, a religion. The question is just not whether, but which. And my argument is that Christian nationalism should be it. Now we put it this way, in a nutshell, Christian nationalism is the belief that the uh, American Christian nationalism is the belief that uh, the American nation is defined by Christianity and the government should take active steps to keep it that way. And yeah. I think that that's entirely appropriate. Right. Um, I know we don't have much more time, but, uh... Yeah, it's that's it is yeah not whether but which, um or how does that like you said like we'll contrast it with globalism, you know contrast it with this versus that like if you're not this okay what are you, and I think too many people like you said the myth of neutrality has probably been the most um, pervasive lie, uh, and I think so much of that I know so much of that has been pur purported by government schools. Right. And, and yeah. well, they're just teaching the facts. And it's like, listen, growing up in the 90s, no, <laughs> you know, government schools in the 90s, like, no, I mean, I remember asking questions and we did. Yeah, they used to do this and that in government schools way back when prayer and, you know, all those other things, you know, good, bad or otherwise. But now it's militant, you know, materialism, it's Darwinism and and all the mm -hmm. rest. And, well, you're just an animal and so on and so forth. Well, we're just teaching science. We're just teaching facts. And it's like, no, that's a worldview. And of course, that's, that's the best way to couch it if you want to convince people that it's not a worldview, right? Like, you know, the whole the whole devil phrase, I forget how it goes, but, you know, the best thing the devil ever did was to convince the world he doesn't exist, right? And so right. Oh, this isn't a worldview. You know, this what we're just trying to be equitable. equitable. We're just trying to be equal. Uh, it's not fair. You know, it, the white, cisgender, heterosexual, blah, blah, blah. Those guys, they've had their day. And I think that's really what a lot of people don't see is people like us you and me we've had our day you know and now we need to sit down we need to wash feet we need you know we need to do these things and it's just like swinging the pendulum in the other direction of showing partiality and certainly as partiality has and was a problem and it still is but now it's just this other direction of now we're preferring these people over this which yeah we're all made in god's image but christian meaning not 
oh, this is only for white people, because no Christian would say that, at least no faithful believer, right? Anybody can come to the knowledge of the truth. Anybody can submit and repent and believe the gospel. Anybody can come unto Christ. And we need to remember that. And then we need to say, that's why Jesus is better. That's why God's ways are better. That's why, you know, Hinduism and Buddhism and, you know, the gay sex religion, blah, 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 won't work. It's not going to save you, right? And so that's the the base of it. But at the same time, all those outworkings from it, I mean, how are we going to live? I mean, Francis Schaeffer, one of my favorites, how should we then live, right? How are we going right. to operate? Uh, that's that's the question we have to ask, so. Uh, yeah, well, well um, I mean, well, if I could. Close out with ahead. this last minute, because this is uh, going to wrap up here. Oh, I, I, would, I would just say, look, our our brothers, would, some brothers would say, there, there isn't this bifurcated choice in front of us, you know, Christian nationalism or rainbow flag nationalism, to which I just say that's that's just not how the world works, right? Mm -hmm. That is that is, I think, a theologian's perspective failing to account for the political realities that are in front of us. And, and I would say that Christian faithfulness, which some of them would propose instead, actually calls for embracing a right conception of the nation state contra globalism and embracing the biblical truth that all nations rule under the authority of God that there's no such thing as neutrality and that that they should honor their Romans, you know, one Romans 13, one through seven responsibilities of being God's servant for the good of his of their people. And that good is not a neutral, valueless good. That's a good that's defined by scripture. And as I've defined it and laid it out here today, I, I don't know who could honestly object to that unless you're just going to be semantically semantically objecting to the terms, you know, and uh, you know what, if you want to put a period between them, go for it. I feel like uh, some Christians like this idea. If you want to be a Christian period nationalist, that's great. Yeah. If you want to be a Baptist period, Christian period, nationalist period, great, go for it. But Christian nationalism is not coerced religion. Uh, Christian nationalism is not pretending people are Christians when they're not. It's a political ideology fundamentally aimed at ordering our civil life together for the good of others, loving our neighbors and the glory of God, loving God with our heart, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yeah, no, that's good. And I think that's something that, uh, especially with the G3 guys and uh, Scott, I forget how you say his last name, Aniel or whatever it is, um, you know, guys like that, you know, well, well, well-meaning and, and, and it's just all about the gospel. And it's like, well, yeah, but like you said, it's a political ideology, not the other way around where we're forcing people to be Christians. Your worldview matters. You have to have an idea. You have to live your life. How are you going to live your life? Is it going to be according to Darwin? Is it going according to secular whatever? I mean, look at the world. How did how did the world come to be? Did God create it or did a series of gods create it or was it materialism? Did gravity create it? How did this get here? Okay, let's start there. And then where does it go from there? How, why do we have marriage? Why do we have a love for our children more than someone else, our, our wife more than someone else, our husband more than another's husband? Like this is basic stuff. And yet it's like, I don't know. Again, there's that myth of neutrality that, that has been so ingrained. I think in everybody living, even if you're super old, it, we've been, we've been told it and awashed with it, swimming in it for years, decades. And we then think, well, that's what it's supposed to be. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to force people. We're not Muslims. And it's like, yeah, we're not Muslims, you know, <laughs> or whatever the argument is. And we think, well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's so funny. Even for somebody who made that comparison, Richard shows me that they don't know what Islam is and they don't understand what we're talking about. Right. Because Islam, you know, Islam is a coercive theofascist religion that seeks to enforce uh, enforce, ex you know, external commitment to their very own religion like qua the religion as in you need to go to the mosque you need to say the prayers etc at the end of the sword right mm -hmm. and and uh nobody is arguing for that when it comes to christian nationalism and all. there's great confusion between the two kingdoms right between the spiritual kingdom and the the physical kingdom the temporal kingdom and and this is where again brothers get confused the idea that a law coerces behavior of course it does Laws always only coerce behavior, but our yep. point is that good good laws coerce your external actions, and 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 it would be a bad law, a non just, an unchristian law that would try to coerce in any way, shape, or form your internal beliefs, and then an expression of that internal belief that you don't believe. But the funny thing is, Richard, is we actually have those sort of laws on the, in our country today, where they try to make Christians 
um, say things related to homosexuality and marriage that we don't believe. We have a we have a badly coercive LGBT nationalism that tries to tries to get us to confess. You know, love is love, science is real. In this house, we believe, and and Christians, we're not arguing for anything like that. But we are saying that we are going to be clear that you know the civil magistrate rules under God. Uh, John Gill, Baptist theologian, actually proposed a fourfold way that the civil magistrate in his commentary on Romans 13 rules for the good of his people. He said physical, moral, civil, and spiritual. And again, this is something you got to, you just have to stop and think. God gave us minds and we need to reason together. Mm. Uh, uh, and a civil magistrate can consider the spiritual good of his people without in any way, shape, or form trying to coerce them to profess belief in any way or to be passing judgment upon their belief. But you could still have the reason to say it is not for the spiritual good of our people that we have gay pride parades or that we have drag queen story hour. That's mm -hmm. not just a moral harm. That's actually a spiritual harm. And I'm going to prevent spiritual harms from being proliferated amongst my populace for their good and God's glory. That is an exercise of the sword, Richard. That's not an exercise of the keys vis-a-vis -vis Matthew 18 and Matthew 16. And, our, and I just wish brothers could think through that a little bit more carefully. Yeah, that's good. Man, there's so much more. Uh, I think we're not too far apart physically from each other. So I think we should yeah. like, maybe even do a one-on-one. A -on -one. I did that when uh, John Harris was in residency at our church last year. We talked uh, in person and I've done that a few other times. It's a little more hassle in one sense, but I think it's worth it. So maybe we can. Yeah, okay. well, you got a great uh, studio there. Let me close yeah. with this. Well, it's not um, very big, so I don't know if you could fit in here as well. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I've been, let me close with this real quick, if that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, this is from uh, a good a good brother, Russ Vogt, and this is his definition of Christian nationalism that I'm trying to get out there too, where he, he would put it this. It's, it's an orientation for engaging in public in the public square that recognizes America as a Christian nation, where our rights and duties are understood to come from God, and where our primary responsibilities as citizens are for building and preserving the strength, prosperity, and health of our own country. Mm. And it comes with an institutional commitment to the separation of church and state, but not the separation of Christianity from its influence on government and society. So Christian nationalism upholds the separation of church and state. It does not uphold the separation of Christianity from society. And it does not uphold the separation of the state from God. You can find that in Russ's uh, op-ed, it's in Newsweek. But I, again, who could argue with that? I know some people will, but I wouldn't want to. Yeah, no, it's true. Well, it's been a pleasure, brother. Uh, thanks. We'll do it again. And uh, that's it. Everybody have a good day and God bless. Thanks, Richard. Thank you.